Professor Chavez, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start off with your background. Where'd you start off? What have you been uh, doing with your career so far? And what are you doing now? I guess working backwards, I, I, right now I'm a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. As uh, my third year at Georgetown, I also have appointments in the government department and the um, School of Public Policy here. Um, I uh, After college, I did my, my doctorate in political science at Oxford, and that's when I started working on legislatures as an institution. Um, my uh, dissertation at Oxford, which then became my first book, um, uh, called Democracy's Privileged Few, was about legislative privilege in British and American constitutional history, about the special uh, sort of rights that, that individual members or individual houses of a legislature have that, that facilitate their representative function. Uh, so after I did that uh, uh, PhD, I, I uh, went to law school. Um, uh, after law school, I, I clerked for a year and then um, for a federal judge, uh, and then uh, started uh, my academic career. I was at uh, Cornell for 12 years before uh, before moving to Georgetown. Um, so, uh, but, but basically my, my, uh, work throughout that time has really, uh, uh, in some sense all come out of what I started working on as a, as a, uh, as a grad student, which is thinking about the way that legislatures work, thinking about the way that legislatures, um, use their own internal procedures and their own internal mechanisms, not only to structure how they do business, but to structure how they, uh, change the world around them, how they interact with other, um, office holders and other other power centers uh, in the government, uh, and how that sort of structures our our national politics. So, what what brought you into this area to begin with? You know, prior to your PhD, was it something in your pa past? And where are you from originally? Uh, so, I, I grew up in Houston. The fact that I would go into academia might be overdetermined. Both my parents were academics, but neither uh, um, neither in political science or or in law. Uh, my mom was a sociologist, and my dad's a geologist. Really, I think it was it was a happy coincidence that I started working on this. I was, um, you know, I got to Oxford as a first year grad student, and I was just going to a whole bunch of different uh, lectures um, just on topics that interested me. And I was actually in a lecture on uh, free speech uh, in the uh, British tradition, and there was one part of that lecture that was devoted to uh, freedom of legislative speech and debate, um, a principle that sort of develops in the um, uh, in the English Constitution, really um, starting in about the. The, the 15th century, um, and then is uh, uh, comes becomes a stronger and stronger norm is actually codified in the U.S. Constitution and Speech or Debate Clause, um, and I was fascinated by that and and um, asked the lecturer if he would if he would work with me and and uh, that sort of became my my dissertation topic and uh, and I was off and running from there. Interesting, you know that that brings up a, you're anticipating a question I had about what it was like to do your PhD in the U.K. versus here, and if that's brought you any kind of unique perspective as you've been doing academic work in the U.S. I think in, in some ways it has. I mean, I, I tend to, my, my work takes a very long view of the development of uh, the mechanisms that I'm interested in. So I do tend to start with parliamentary uh, history and think about um, how and why these, these mechanisms developed, in particular how they were used um, in the context of 17th century conflicts between the Stuart Crown um, and, and Parliament as a sort of rising force in the, in the um, English state. Uh, and so I think, um, uh, and then sort of tracing that through, you know, uh, as it moves across the Atlantic, as it gets incorporated into colonial political life, early state political life and, 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 the, and uh, life under the constitution. Um, so I think having the perspective of sort of starting my education in the UK and, and thinking, or at least starting my graduate education in the UK um, and thinking about it that way uh, has has really, um, uh, I think, been a benefit. Interesting. So the work you're, uh, obviously you've moved on from this free speech concept, although is there anything you'd like to share with us there that you you did and any kind of interesting questions you had or you found in that in that work before we move on to some of this other congressional speech issues? Yeah, well, I mean, so the... the um, you know, the way that I still, uh, you know, I've, I've actually written a fair amount about the speech or debate clause in the Constitution. And, and in some sense, the, the original Constitution's only mention of speech, right? Uh, you know, the, the First Amendment, of course, is an amendment. Um, but the original Constitution, the, the, the protection that for speech that it gives is, is speech in Congress. Um, and this has been a, a sort of really important um, uh, tool throughout, um, throughout American history. Uh, in ways that it allows um, 
uh, especially members of Congress to sort of push back against the executive branch. It allows members of Congress, for example, to um, uh, spill state secrets on the floor if they want to. So um, Senator Mike Gravel in the 1970s actually released the Pentagon Papers um, uh, while, it, while the um, you know, Washington Post and New York Times were still tied up in litigation with the federal government over whether they could publish the Pentagon Papers. Um, Mike Gravel just read them into the, um, into the congressional record. Um, so, uh, and you know, more recently, um, uh, uh, several senators um, have have talked about uh, secret legal interpretations under the Patriot Act on the Senate floor um, as a way of sort of moving the debate forward in a way that the executive branch wouldn't like, and in a way that might be punishable um, uh, if they weren't doing it in this context. So, I think it's a very important uh, uh, tool of congressional power and and one that sort of facilitates democratic governance. Very interesting. So let's talk more about speech, but you, you have a concept called overspeech or congressional overspeech. Can you talk through that, what it is? You know, you wrote a book about it. You know, what questions did you have and what did you find? My idea of overspeech is, is essentially using the tools of oversight, but for a communicative purpose, right? So we tend to think of oversight. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, built into the metaphor, right? Sight is in some sense passive, right? So you, you know, there's something out in the world and it, you perceive it through the through sight, whereas speech is sort of projecting something out into the world, right? Speech is uh, a way that you make others aware of what you think. My argument is that the tools and mechanisms of congressional oversight not only have been used throughout our history as uh, in, in communicative ways, but also that that's a sort of important and legitimate function of them. So the, the sort of consensus view of oversight is that it should be sort of receptive, that it should be uh, nonpartisan, right? It should just be about sort of gathering facts. Um, and of course, facts are facts. They don't care what party you are. So it should be nonpartisan, ideally bipartisan, it should be consensus based, right? Um, and there is a lot, even under sort of current conditions of high polarization, um, there's a lot of work, uh, recent, uh, a great recent book by a, a young scholar named Maya Kornberg um, that, that shows that there is still a lot of oversight that does sort of fit in that consensus mold. But we also have a long and important tradition of the use of those same tools, but for communicative and for performative purposes. Um, so uh, in the article that I wrote uh, titled Congressional Overspeech, I, I take two case studies from a much from earlier period. So one is the Nye Committee hearings um, in the 1930s. These are also called the Merchant of Death hearings. That was um, hearings that were um, uh, based off the premise that um, the munitions industry had sort of um, uh, maneuvered the United States into entering World War I. Um, and those hearings were, um, you know, took advantage of the sort of cutting edge technology of radio broadcasting. Um, uh, they were they were gripping. They you know they made the front page of made every major newspaper almost every day that they held hearings. They called um, uh, people like John Pierpoint Morgan to testify, um, uh, uh, the Dupont family to testify, and these uh, uh, facing incredibly aggressive questioning. And it really had the effect of tying FDR's hands. The the the, the Roosevelt administration came to detest the Nye Committee because. As Roosevelt wanted to move the United States into um, into entering World War II, it was actually a sort of non-interventionist um, uh, block that that was that was sort of centered around the Nye Committee, that was uh, making it harder and harder for him to do that. Um, uh, yeah, so this was a this was a sort of set of hearings to place over about a year and a half that really was trying to send a message to the public and was using sort of technology, was using sort of thoughtfulness about how to structure its hearings, how to um, uh, uh, present them to the public um, uh, uh, as a way of, uh, of changing public mind and, and consolidating public opinion. Um, so that's sort of one earlier example. And then obviously, you know, uh, fast forward to, to, you know, last year, right, I think the January 6th committee is doing something, uh, was doing something very similar, right? That, that um, they had a message that they wanted to send and they were using, uh, again, sort of taking advantage of the cutting edge technology of today uh, rather than the 1930s, um, but using uh, hearings as a way of sending that message out to the public, as a way of trying to convince people in the public and, and change people's minds. So that's what I what I mean by overspeech. And, and I think it's a really important way that Congress as an institution can sort of seize some of the bully pulpit in a way that, allow, that allows it to, to sort of, uh, at, at least at times, uh, uh, stand on an even playing field with someone like the president who can always go out and give a speech and command a tremendous amount of attention. Um, so I think this is a really important uh, uh, tool that Congress uh, has used and and uh, should be using. And so part of what I'm trying to do is push back against this idea that um, 
uh, it's, it's, you know, mere political theater or it's degraded, it's, it's you know, reality show. You see all of these um, unflattering metaphors used to, de to describe it when Congress does this, but I actually think it's a really important thing that Congress does. So the way you described, you know, the earlier committee and the, and the most recent one, you know, it, it sounded like you're treating the committee as this individual unit, right? The committee says X, Y, or Z, or the committee is doing X, Y, or Z, when in fact, these committees, of course, are made up of real people, and those real people may be diametrically opposed in what they want the committee to communicate. Uh, there may be a majority, um, but there may be a minority of the committee and maybe a very strong one or uh, that wants to vocalize a totally different message to the public. So how did you untie that when you were looking at those types of questions? Is it really when you say the committee, do you really mean the majority of the committee? Or do you mean that the committee itself as a group does have some kind of unified version of what they want to put out into the world? So that's a great question. And, and one of the interesting things that, that, that is true of both the Nye Committee and the January 6th Committee um, is that they were select committees and that um, everyone on those committees was unified behind at least the basic thesis that the committee was pursuing. Um, uh, so the Nye Committee um, uh, uh, um, was, uh, both of those committees were bipartisan committees, right? The Nye Committee um, uh, uh, had, I think, one more Republican than Democrat, but um, uh, but was a bipartisan committee. The um, January 6th committee, of course, had two Republicans on it. Um, but uh, both of those committees, everyone on the committee was sort of unified behind the central thesis of the committee. In, in, in the Nye committee case, that was, uh, you know, this, this merchants of death thesis. In the January 6th committee case, that was uh, that the January 6th ins insurrection was a, you know, bad thing that there were um, uh, sort of actors responsible for it and that it had been sort of coordinated at the, at the White House level in at least some way. Um, Obviously, there you know that that high level agreement might mask some uh, disagreements over the details, but at the very least, I think it, it's plausible to talk in, in those contexts about the committee having a view. Frequently, that won't be the case, of course, um, especially with standing committees um, uh, uh, where they aren't put together for you know one unified purpose, or even select committees where there's sort of significant disagreement among the members. Um, it is still the case that that um, you know the, the the committee majority is going to be the one that sort of is able to drive the agenda. But you know, in 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 contexts where there's a significant split on the committee, um, you you want uh, you know the both the majority and the minority can be thinking in terms of over speech, right? They can each be thinking in terms of okay, how can we structure this so as to make sure the 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 public receives the message that we want them to receive, um, either in addition to or instead of the message that the other side wants them to receive. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's talk a little bit more about these other kinds of um, communication. So, uh, you know, on the one side, I can understand a committee, a unified committee presenting a certain point of view to the public, educating the public about some kind of issue, trying to move the public on a particular mm -hmm. issue if it's a if it's a unified committee. Then I can think about, OK, there's a, a faction within the committee, you know, a majority or a minority or what have you, and they each have a different message that they want to give. Right. So you have Republicans want to say X or the, the Whigs want to say Y, you know, as a unified mi you know, minority or majority group within the committee. So I can imagine some kind of speech that has a different intention. Right. And that intention might be to uh, say that the other side doesn't know what they're talking about or maybe something else. And then I can think of the, uh, you know, sort of factional level within the committee communication. And then I can think about the individual in the committee. Right. And they may want to give a speech to, you know, make somebody happy back home, to get votes, to get money, you know, so there's a, a very personal kind of selfish uh, way that the communication can be used. When you think about those three levels, is that the way you, is that the way you kind of think about them? And are, did you break it down any further? And are there different purposes? And has it changed over time? I'm not sure the basic incentive structure changes much over time. I, I, the the way that one construct the way that one tries to send one's message into the world, the way that one uh, sort of constructs these hearings, if you're trying to use them for this purpose, does of course change over time. Uh, in large part, as a function of changing technologies of communication, right? So you're going to do things differently if you're focused on sort of live radio broadcasts and and sort of photographs in the next day's newspaper on the one hand, than if you're thinking about um, you know, in the January 6th committee context, uh, you know, live primetime hearings or other committees, maybe you're thinking about, okay, what's going to work well as a, a 30 second video that I can post on Twitter, right? Those are all sort of uh, going to lead you to act in different ways um, uh, to try to get the message out there. Um, I think what is constant across these technologies of communication, though, is the desire to use them uh, in order to send um, uh, certain kinds of messages. I think um, uh, in terms of the sort of different levels at which the, those might want to be sent, I think that's that's absolutely right, right? So different um, uh, uh, actors are going to have different 
uh, audiences in mind, different agendas in mind, um, uh, and um, uh, sometimes sort of multiple audiences and agendas in mind uh, simultaneously. To the extent that you have lots of different actors trying to play to lots of different audiences, that probably mutes the overall communicative impact, right? And so it's not a coincidence that sort of the more unified the committee is, the more of an impact it's going to make, right? So whether we're talking about Nye or January 6th, whereas if you have sort of bickering back and forth, you know, um, uh, say the Benghazi hearings um, or um, uh, potentially going forward, the um, uh, subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government, right? You could imagine that to sort of winding up being a sufficient amount of sort of squabbling between the parties that really it doesn't send uh, much of a unified message to anyone, right? So my argument about overspeech certainly isn't that all attempts at it are effective, right? But it's that um, uh, under the right conditions, they can be tremendously effective and indeed have been in the past. What about the role of transparency um, on the committee itself? You know, one thing we've talked a lot about in this program is the impact of transparency and where it's a, where it's, you know, benefited society and where, you know, privacy may be a better option in particular for committees if you want to have a better outcome. So when I think about the, you know, your concept over a long period of time, obviously committee hearings may or may not have been transparent, right, uh, to the public. And that ch would change the, the incentive dramatically because I would assume if, you know, if the, if the hearing is transparent, it gives it gives uh, options for the members to make statements of their own, right, for for the public. And if uh, or, you know, the Republicans or the Democrats can get unified and say the same thing over and over and try to drill that into the public. But if the hearing is closed, all those opportunities are gone, right? And then it, ultimately it might be the chairman who controls the message to the public, regardless of the dissent with inside the committee. So how is that concept of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the concept of transparency in your mind, how does that play out for committees, their incentives, and whether they'd be effective or not at any of the, any of what the committee is supposed to do? I think to the extent that you are trying to use these hearings uh, as over speech, that is to the extent that you're trying to use them to communicate, it more or less relies on transparency. Um, uh, closed hearings have very little communicative impact because it's true you could still you know wind up uh, uh, releasing a committee report at the end of those hearings. Um, but for the most part, those committee reports are not going to be sort of widely read or widely disseminated, right? The way that you um, uh, get public attention is by having these uh, hearings be open. So even before, so that, you know, the 1970s sort of marks the moment where hearings become presumptively open and you need a reason to close them. Before that, hearings were sort of presumptively closed. But the hearings that were intended to be communicative, that were intended to make a splash and send a message were always open, right? So whether we're talking about the Nye Committee hearings or the McCarthy hearings or the Army McCarthy hearings or the organized crime hearings, right? These were all hearings that were open, that invited in you know, either the, the, the radio microphones or later the television cameras that uh, invited in the print re uh, reporters. Um, indeed, for a lot of these uh, sort of big blockbuster hearings, they actually built additional seating in the hearing room uh, and additional sort of uh, tiered banks for the reporters and for the cameras. Um, so uh, uh, to the extent that you're using them to try to send a message, um, uh, it, even before the sort of era of presumptive openness, uh, those hearings were always the ones that were open and made accessible. Closed hearings, I think, uh, you know, obviously there are some situations in which hearings are closed because, you know, basically the only hearings that are closed now uh, are ones where there uh, might be information uh, disclosed in those hearings that, that uh, people don't want being released to the public. So intelligence committee hearings are presumptively closed, uh, sometimes foreign affairs committee, sometimes armed services committee. You know, there is a significant literature in political science suggesting that the move towards openness, and this is now moving maybe away from oversight and towards things like markups, um, that the that the move towards presumptive openness uh, has some real costs, uh, right? That it makes it easier for outside groups to monitor deals and therefore um, uh, sort of facilitates capture, um, and that it moves actual deliberation out of the hearing and into sort of pre-hearing, you know, backroom discussions. I think that I think there's a lot to those uh, critiques. That said, um, openness seems to me like a, a sort of a one-way ratchet for purposes of, of public consumption. That is, it's really hard. It would be really hard to imagine uh, uh, members justifying to the public a, a move back to presumptively closed uh, markups or something like that. So um, I think there are costs to it, but I think those are costs that we have just committed to bear into the indefinite future. So the concept of overspeech, um... Are there hard and fast rules to say what's 
over speech and what isn't? You know, did you come up with a quantitative model? How do you how do you figure yeah. out what's over speech and what's actual trying to get information from a witness for you know purposes of oversight directly? So my I mean my argument isn't that they are two distinct things. My argument is that they are um, two different. Uh, uses of the same tools, or not even different uses, like the, the, they, the, they often coexist, um, uh, that they're just sort of uh, conceptual frameworks for thinking about what's going on. So I think, you know, basically every hearing is going to have some elements of both, right? Obviously, the January 6th committee uh, did a tremendous amount of gathering of information in addition to their communicative um, uh, functions. And even the most sort of technical, dry, boring, you know, only on C-SPAN 26 hearing uh, also has some element of communication to it, even if they're just trying to communicate to like 12 lobbyists who happen to really carefully follow that area or something like that. So there's no, I, you know, I don't think there's any going to be any hearing where you characterize it as 100% one or 100% of the other. Um, uh, and I'm not looking to sort of draw that kind of dichotomy. What I'm tr what I'm trying to do um, uh, in, in the, the overspeech piece is simply to say, um, that the communication is an essential, important part of this, and that there are uh, uh, some hearings uh, and some uses of these tools that are really sort of primarily aimed at uh, public communication, public persuasion, and that we ought to think of that as a legitimate and good use of these tools. Um, so it really is um, uh, primarily aimed to be a corrective to this idea that anytime someone is using these uh, opportunities for public communication, that they're just grandstanding or engaged in kabuki theater, or just, again, any of these um, uh, metaphors that sort of sound in the anti-theatrical prejudice um, that, that, are, that are used to sort of denigrate uh, uh, this. And I want, to, I want to rehabilitate it. Well, you bring up the, a core question there about the purpose of the legislature, right? So, you know, is it to legislate? Uh, and to figure out the best information in order to do so, or does it have some role in communication to the public, uh, either about what it's doing or altering its perceptions about, um, you know, problems or what solutions there may be to those problems? So it sounds like you have a, a philosophy of legislatures that goes beyond legislating. So can you talk a little bit about absolutely what do you think the legislature's role is in educating the public? Uh, or I don't know if the word education is correct, but uh, providing information to the public. What led, what information should a legislature provide to the public, and for what purpose? That's yeah. So I think that's exactly right. I, I have a, a an understanding of what the legislature's role is that goes well beyond simply passing statutes into law. I think that that is obviously part of of Congress's role, um, but uh, uh, traditionally a huge part of the legislature's role has also uh, been. Uh, uh, oversight. It's been public communication. It's been um, uh, a whole host of, of, of uh, uh, things that are not just passing statutes and are not even just um, sort of preliminary to passing statutes. Um, so, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson in his, um, uh, in his book, uh, Congressional Government, which was actually came out of his doctoral dissertation in the 1880s, um, said that he thought that the informing function of Congress was actually its most important function, that it was more important even than passing legislation, um, uh, that Congress um, uh, among other things, and I think this is even uh, you know only grown since then, right? As the administrative state has gotten bigger and bigger, a more important part of what Congress does is simply keep watch on the administrative state, make sure that the administrative state is carrying out the directions that Congress has given it in statute, uh, rather than going off and doing something else on its own, right? And that's oversight, and that's oversight that is backed up by things uh, like uh, the the annual appropriations process, where if they think some part of the administrative state has gotten out of hand, they can sort of use tugs on the purse strings to try to bring it back in line. So I think that there is, um, uh, I think public communication is a huge part of it. And um, actually the the sort of first uh, section of uh, my 2017 book, Congress's Constitution, um, tries to sort of lay out a theory of the separation of powers uh, in which um, uh, sort of the core uh, aspect, the core way that the branches compete in the separation of powers arena is by trying to win over the public, right? So public communication is actually front and center um, uh, in this understanding of the separation of powers. And so a big part of what Congress is doing, um, whether it's through oversight hearings uh, or through the various other ways in which members, houses, parties in Congress communicate with the public uh, is trying to convince them that, hey, our institution should be trusted with relatively more power other institutions should be trusted with relatively less, right? Throw your support behind us. And that's how institutions gain power over time, uh, which means that communication is really 
uh, key here is really a, a, a central part of what uh, Congress does. So given your your perspective on this communication function, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about, you know, the intermediary channels, you know, so obviously over time, in theory, Congress could make everybody in the United States, you know, or they could ask everyone or maybe they could mandate, I'm not sure, but have, it, have an app or something. They could call everybody and, and, and Congress could have an official wire that everybody have to listen to every morning, you know, it's something straight out of the, uh, out of Hanoi back in the, um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so, so like broadcast its message to everyone. On the other hand, it it has, you know, these media, these media institutions, right. It has to go through the the networks or it has to go, the individuals go through Twitter or whatever, you know, it, it's kind of a chaotic mix that's not centralized in terms of there's some centralization to the information flow from Congress to the public, but it's not planned by any central way. And it's not systematically invested in. So I'm curious, what's your analysis of the, you know, but okay, Congress should make all these, create all this information, but all these people over here, how should it get from over here to there? Um, well, so I think one thing that's important to, to note is that there are, of course, centralized coordinating mechanisms in Congress. We call them parties, right? Um, one of the things that party leadership does is uh, sort of set agendas for you know, members of that party. Um, the majority party leadership sets the agenda for the for the chamber, but they also coordinate around things like messaging. So, um, uh, you know, uh, you can sort of identify, uh, you know, the, the House Republican position on X or um, the Democratic, you know, House Democratic position on Y. Um, so there is, uh, it, it's not quite as chaotic, I think, as, as, as uh, uh, you know, 535 members of Congress each uh, tweeting whatever they think, right? There, there is, uh, there are coordinating mechanisms. Um, but it is also the case that that um, uh, you know Congress is a they, not an it, um, uh, and so there is a um, you know one of the problems that collective decision making institutions have to overcome is how to coordinate and then how to um, uh, convey that coordination to others, right? Um, uh, and that's tough, and it's it's in some sense a uh, disadvantage that legislatures uh, tend to start with, as contrasted with executives, right? So um, you know. Joe Biden can stand at a microphone and announce the position of the presidency, um, and he's the only one who's going to be uh, uh, sort of talking about that. Whereas it is true that the you know the 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 Speaker of the House or the Majority Leader in the Senate can say, "Hey, here's here's what our caucus thinks," but you're still going to have a, a bunch of other voices. You know, you're going to have um, uh, uh, you know Chip Roy saying, "Actually, the Speaker's not speaking for me," or you're going to have Joe Manchin saying that you know Chuck Schumer's not speaking for me. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and and that does present a sort of uh, difficulty in getting the message across. In some sense, that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in this idea uh, of, of uh, overspeech as coming out of the committee process, because in those situations, whether it's, you know, Nye or January 6th or others, where the committee can speak relatively univocally, um, it is uh, um, able to do so in a way that uh, comes to uh, sort of mirror the the the, the president's soapbox, um, right? And and it's uh, able to do that sort of with the trappings of uh, Congress as an institution, right? It's able to do it in a committee room that's you know got wood paneling and leather seats and and um, uh, American flags and the Great Seal of the United States, right? Um, uh, and and this goes to this idea of it being theatrical, right? That that um, uh, scene setting matters, um, uh, and so that I think. Uh, to the extent they are able to to unify around a message, sending it that way actually has added oomph to just um, uh, you know sending a tweet or going on Meet the Press or something like that. Yeah, I mean the, the you, you mentioned the parties. The, the challenge with parties is they're extra congressional, right? They're they're not Congress. They happen to be they happen to have members in Congress, but there's no official party system in Congress itself, or at least there wasn't in the Constitution. There maybe they they tried to get one in now. Uh, but, you know, so I agree with you that if Congress is to speak, right, it, it makes sense for it to come from a committee or from a speaker uh, that are formal institutions that were that are um, that aren't rooted in something like a party, which is extra congressional. Although I guess the committees also themselves weren't contemplated when they first wrote the Constitution. Well, committees were, I mean, committees were known, right? There were committees of the, of the British Parliament. Um, there were committees in the um, uh, in the state legislatures. Um, uh, you know, for the first uh, decade or so, uh, 
uh, Congress relied mostly on ad hoc committees. It's not until the speakership of Henry Clay, starting in about 1811, that you, that that the the primary mix moves to um, to standing committees. But they did anticipate there being committees. But I'll also say, you know, I. Um, you know, parties aren't in the capital C Constitution. You know, the document that you can go read, but but parties are are absolutely indispensable to our sort of lived Constitution. Um, uh, it, it, there's no modern democratic state that doesn't have a party system. Um, and um, you know, I, there are. Uh, it's true that the that the parties uh, are uh, more than just you know their their members of Congress, right? They structure they more pervasively structure our political life. But it's also true that there are party mechanisms that are Congress specific and indeed chamber specific, right? So there's the the Republican House Conference, there's the Democratic House Caucus, there's the you know Republican Senate Caucus, the Democratic Senate Caucus. They each have leadership structures. They each have identifiable um, uh, leaders, and uh, those do you know those serve as uh, coordination points. I just want to ask one more question about this. Uh... Over speech before we move on to other subjects. So a particular kind of overspeech, I think, would be one member communicating to another member uh, through this overspeech or one, you know, or it could be, as you say, the Republicans or the Democrats communicating with each other through this overspeech, signaling one or another policy stance or, you know, where they might come out in a vote or where they are in a particular thing. So have you looked at that in detail and how does that actually play out as a negotiation of positions or um, how does that work in signaling to each other, not to external parties, right? Uh, like the audience or the, you know, the voters or lobbyists or whoever, corporations or whoever, if they're just signaling to each other through the questioning, how does that, what have you found there? I think there's relatively little of that because there are so many other uh, uh, opportunities for the members to, to communicate with one another. Um, uh, so I think, you know, for the most part, um, uh, when the, when their audience truly is another member, um, that's the kind of conversations that will happen, uh, sort of uh, away from the cameras that um, that will happen, um, uh, you know, in in their offices or something like that. Um, I think if they're having uh, a conversation in front of the cameras in a in a committee hearing, it's probably because they are not one another's audience, but they're trying to communicate to some other audience. Got it. Makes sense. Great. Well, let's move on to uh, another subject, which is, you know, an area you've clearly spent a lot of work is thinking about this interbranch kinds of, uh, you know, communication and where Congress fits and Congress's power relative to the other branches and control. So can you talk through, you know, what have you, what what's the work that you've done there and what, what questions were you trying to answer and what have you found? Right. So this is, um, this is sort of the core question of uh, that 2017 book I mentioned earlier uh, called Congress's Constitution. Um, and the, the, and it actually goes back to something we talked about a, a minute ago. You know, the, the the sort of question I start with in that book is, um, okay, so you let's say you've got a conflict between Congress and another branch, whether that other branch is the presidency, the courts. Um, what can Congress do, right? What tools does Congress have available? And um, you know, the first thing to note is that the the ability to pass legislation is likely to be singularly unhelpful because um, pr the president can veto legislation, right? And it's really hard to get two thirds super majorities in both houses to override a presidential veto. If the courts don't like a piece of legislation, they can either say that it's unconstitutional or interpret it into oblivion. Um, uh, and so that's unlikely to be uh, promising if they're trying to rein in the courts. So what else can they do, right? Um, uh, uh, how should we understand their tools in interbranch fights? And the, um, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they're thinking about Congress, basically stop with legislation. And I think that leads to a lot of pessimism about what, uh, you know, about Congress's constitutional role, be precisely because they see those. And then they say, oh, well, I guess there's, you know, I guess Congress is just doomed to fecklessness, at least when it disagrees with the other branches. And my argument is, um, no, there's actually a lot of other things that Congress can do um, and that it, it regularly does do to sort of promote its position in these conflicts. And so if we turn our attention away from primarily passing laws and to other things, we, act, you know, these tools actually uh, come into view. So um, uh, in the book, I, I identify and have chapters on uh, six of these uh, powers. I, I divide them into uh, what I call hard powers and soft powers. Um, so the three hard powers are the power of the purse, um, so that is to say the ability uh, to uh, fund or more importantly, not fund uh, something that they don't like, right? Um, and although the power of the purse does have to be exercised through legislation, because at least for discretionary funding, uh, uh, we do annual legislation, uh, annual appropriations, uh, 
Um, uh, it is the case that every year Congress, you know, either House of Congress could simply refuse to fund something. And then we either get a shutdown or the, um, uh, uh, you know, or the other branches cave to, to, to that House's position. Um, so the uh, uh, power of the purse, um, what I call the personnel power. So this is a combination of um, uh, the Senate's role in uh, confirming nominees, uh, um, uh, Congress's role in structuring offices, including creating some offices that are that don't serve at the pleasure of the president, um, and uh, um, uh, impeachment and removal. Uh, and uh, the the third sort of hard power is contempt of Congress. Um, so the ability to demand information uh, from not only private actors but from the other branches as well, um, uh, with the possibility of uh, uh, sanctions backing that up, and indeed, uh, historically, with the ability to enforce that themselves, that is to say, um, uh, at the extreme, to use uh, their sergeant at arms to arrest contenders. And then the three soft powers I talk about, one of them is, uh, again, this is something we already talked a little bit about, but the speech or debate clause, the ability to send uh, uh, their message out into the public, even if it's a message that the other branches don't want received by the public, uh, the ability to do that without worrying about um, uh, sort of facing uh, sanctions for it. Uh, the second uh, soft power I talk about in the book is um, uh, the House's power to discipline their own members. Um, and it seems uh, uh, at first a little bit weird to think about this in terms of a power that operates against the other branches. But what I noticed is that there's actually uh, sort of significant uh, uh, evidence to, su to support the idea that um, when the uh, chambers actually sort of act themselves to root out uh, uh, perceived corruption in their midst, that they actually gain public standing from that, um, and that that actually does wind up empowering them uh, as against the other branches. Whereas when they um, uh, sort of outsource congressional ethics enforcement to the executive or to the courts, uh, they correspondingly lose power. Um, and then the last uh, uh, sort of soft power I talk about is the, the cameral rulemaking power. So the Constitution has the rules of proceedings clause that allows each chamber to uh, structure its own proceedings. Um, and this has significant implications for its power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other branches. So I talk in that chapter about the uh, development of standing rules in the, uh, st sorry, standing committees in the early 19th century and the way that actually allowed the, the houses of Congress to develop internal expertise that allowed them to sort of match up against uh, the, the executive branch. That if you look at the first Congress, in fact, uh, almost all of the legislation passed by the first Congress was in fact drafted by Washington's cabinet officers. A lot of it was drafted by Hamilton. Some of it was drafted by Jefferson. Some of it was drafted by Knox. Um, but uh, um, almost none of it was drafted in Congress because Congress just didn't have the expertise and the, and the institutional structure. And it's really when Clay becomes speaker and says, we are going to develop uh, partly because Clay doesn't get along with Madison, who's president at that point. Clay says, we're going to develop our own institutional expertise, and that will allow us to go toe to toe with the executive. So um, uh, something like developing the committee structure isn't just internal to the houses of Congress. It's actually something that allows them to project power out into the world. I argue that on the flip side of that, um, something like the filibuster in the in the in the uh, 21st century Senate, that is to say, the sort of standing requirement that everything has to have 60 votes to pass, actually acts to disempower the Senate vis-a-vis -vis other institutions. That if you look at um, uh, uh, presidents, um, uh, whether we're talking about um, uh, Obama or Trump, um, uh, have used the the Senate's uh, have used the, the 60 vote threshold uh, as a sort of rhetorical prop to justify. Um, uh, aggressive executive action, right? That, that uh, the, you know, say this didn't even get an up or down vote in the Senate. Um, that's intolerable gridlock. And so I'm going to do this through the administrative state and not wait for Congress. Um, so that's a way that I think that, you know, um, used poorly, uh, the, the sort of cameral rulemaking authority uh, actually de detracts from congressional power. So the, the sort of summation of all this, right, is that um, I, I'm, I'm interested in all of these things that aren't uh, stat passing statutes, but that nevertheless have significant impacts for congressional power uh, and congressional ability to get its way as a uh, sort of as against the other branches. I'm, I'm curious to dig a little bit deeper into your concept around the committees uh, and their kind of balancing the executive power just through their formation, right? And their and basically their bully pulpit concept. So, since committees haven't changed much, right? But I would presume, and maybe I'm wrong, that the federal government has changed more the executive branch has changed more than the committee structure has changed in over a same period. Is that an additional reason to back kind of committee scope changes so that you have these kind of coherent voices in Congress, not just from a legislative point of view, but also from a kind of messaging point of view to the other branches? Well, I mean, it's, it's 
it's worth noting that the committee structures have changed um, uh, over time as well. Um, so first of all, in, um, uh, it wasn't until the very end of the 19th century um, that you had uh, any significant amount of staffing in Congress at all. Um, uh, so uh, the mere fact that committees uh, now have uh, uh, have staffs is uh, is important. Um, uh, both the 1947, uh, sorry, 1946 and the 1972 Legislative Reorganization Acts um, uh, sort of uh, changed committee jurisdiction and tried to sort of uh, uh, rationalize committee jurisdiction given the way that the uh, executive branch had changed over time. Um, so committee structures have changed. In addition to that, there are other things um, that, you know, like the development of committees come out of, of, of the Cameron rulemaking authority um, that have significantly enhanced congressional capacity. So um, the development of the Congressional Research Service, of the Congressional Budget Office, of uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, um, the Joint Committee on Taxation, all of these um, congressional support agencies um, uh, that are sort of internal to the legislative branch, um, but develop significant amounts of expertise, have significant sort of fact-finding capabilities um, uh, that, that, that sort of supplement the expertise and fact-finding capabilities that, that exist in the committees uh, themselves. You know, these are all ways that, um, that Congress sort of develops its own capacity and, and helps it to sort of come closer to uh, uh, parity with the with the executive branch. Now, one thing I would certainly right. suggest is that it needs to go further in that um, in that direction. And in particular, that um, and you know this is something that the the last Congress, the last two Congresses, the the House Modernization Committee, um, uh, I think was was really focused on it, and rightly so. Um, you know, staffing levels are lower than they were. Uh, 30 years ago, staff pay is uh, in, in real dollars lower than it was 30 years ago, which means of course that staff turnover is through the roof. Um, there are ways in which Congress could enhance its own uh, uh, internal capacity uh, uh, simply by um, uh, sort of devoting a little bit more uh, resources to these institutions. Um, and that's sort of the way I would want to encourage Congress to think about congressional power. Again, not pass, not trying to sort of uh, necessarily focus on passing grand statutes that are going to reign in the executive. You know, if you have the support and you can get those through, by all means do it. But there are a whole host of lower hanging fruits out there um, uh, involving things like, hey, just, you know, increase GAO's budget a little bit um, uh, because, uh, you know, they, they are a tremendously effective watchdog and provide a lot of information uh, to Congress that Congress can then use to pursue its other goals. So, yeah, can you talk through about I talk through a few of the, I guess, recommendations you would have then on this non-legislative aspect of Congress. Where would you want to take it? Obviously, it sounds like you you want more of the GAO. What other, what else is on your list of things that would have enhanced its its power, uh, if that's your ultimate goal for the Congress? Absolutely. So, um, uh, thinking through a few things. One, um, uh, when it comes to information disputes with the executive. I would like to see Congress be um, both a lot more aggressive in its uh, use of the contempt power and to stop going to court to try to, to get its contempt citations enforced. Um, Congress always loses when it goes to court, even when it wins. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, for the last three administrations, um, there have been disputes over access to information. In the George W. Bush administration, it was the contempt against uh, Harriet Myers and Josh Bolton um, uh, arising out of testimony uh, dealing with the, the firing of a bunch of U.S. attorneys. In the Obama administration, it was uh, contempt of Congress against Eric Holder um, dealing with a congressional investigation into the fast and furious gun walking operation. Um, and then in the Trump administration, it was it was uh, everything, right? Trump said, we're, we're, def we're not uh, complying with any of the subpoenas. In all three of those uh, administrations, uh, the House of Representatives then went to court seeking uh, various uh, orders ordering the administration to comply. In all three of those administrations, in, to at least some degree, when those cases were finally resolved, the House of Representatives won its case. The problem is the um, uh, Bush administration cases were resolved during the Obama administration. The Obama administration cases were resolved during the Trump administration, and the Trump administration cases some of them are still ongoing, and the ones that have been resolved were all resolved during the Biden administration. The, the sort of end result then is that this is an oversight, right? Even if you technically win the case, um, uh, you're not overseeing the administration uh, that you were trying to oversee because that administration is gone now. Um, so I would like to see uh, the houses really thinking much more creatively about other tools uh, other than going to court that they could use to enforce their information demands. So some of this, you know, the, the, the extreme, 
um, you know, I'd like to see them uh, uh, beef up the sergeant at arms capacity to arrest contenders. There have been at least two instances in U.S. history where uh, the sergeant at arms arrested an executive branch contender. Um, the last time was in 1915 when they uh, arrested a, um, a, the a U.S. attorney for New York. Um, before that, it was um, uh, 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 an ambassador uh, to China that they arrested. Um, but uh, but uh, you know there are uh, there are things short of that, and in particular, I'd like to see them be more creative uh, about using the power of the purse uh, in response to um, to contempt. So for one thing, I see absolutely no reason why Congress should pay the salary of an executive branch official who's currently in contempt of Congress. Um, but even beyond that, you could think about using the power of the purse in ways that squeezes the 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 executive branch such that they decide to comply with the subpoenas. So that's sort of one area that I've been thinking a lot about that I'd like to see um, uh, Congress change its behavior. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think that the uh, filibuster has significant effects, not just in terms of what legislation gets passed, but also in terms of uh, systematically disempowering um, uh, Congress. Um, so uh, if it were up to me, I would like to see the legislative filibuster uh, abolished. Um, uh, and then I would like to see significantly more resources uh, devoted to congressional capacity. So, you know, the 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 total budget of the legislative branch is minuscule compared to, you know, compared to the federal budget. Um, uh, uh, I think, you know, first of all, members are underpaid. Um, uh, and this is because, uh, you know, it's not popular to vote for a pay raise for yourself. Um, uh, and the 27th Amendment, you know, says that uh, uh, the pay raise can't take place until the next Congress starts. Um, but they're underpaid, and that and 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 that that affects sort of who chooses to run for Congress, um, and it affects sort of uh, uh, when they choose to leave Congress. Um, uh, and I think that's unfortunate. More importantly, their staff is massively underpaid. Um, uh, you know, there are incredibly smart, hardworking, dedicated people. Um, uh, you know, working in the public service uh, for members of Congress, for congressional committees um, uh, who are, are paid just a pittance. And that means there's massive turnover, which means you don't develop the kind of um, uh, expertise you need. So I'd like to see more staffing and better paid staffing, both member staffing, committee staffing, but then also the support agencies as well. Um, congressional Research Service, GAO, all of these um, do tremendously good work and tremendously important work. Um, there are studies suggesting that um, uh, every dollar spent on GAO um, uh, because of the sort of effectiveness of their oversight results in something like $100 uh, of, of government savings because they're um, uh, really good at sort of uh, uh, rooting out um, uh, waste and corruption. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there are um, a, a lot of things, uh, sort of uh, incremental things like that, that Congress could do that would, that would really help um, uh, enhance its position as against the other branches. So I'm curious about your your position on increasing the budget for communication staff, both in the member level, also in the committee level. You know, I, I think it's generally thought that uh, legislative staff have decreased over time, and the amount of communication staff and uh, and constituent service staff has increased over time with the same budgets, right? So it's even more even even more dramatic than would be implied by the by the static uh, or declining um, budgets of the members over since the time you mentioned. So what's your perspective on what percentage of that budget should be on the on the communication staff versus the others if, if you increase it? I, I don't want my sort of uh, discussion of, of the importance of public communication to be taken as meaning like you know, the, the entirety of the job is just um, uh, is, is just comms. I, I certainly don't think that's the case. I think it is an important part of the job. And I think um, uh, it is important that members have uh, communication staff. I think it's important that committees have communication staff. And so I, I certainly wouldn't want to, um, you know, eliminate those. You know, I think there are certainly some members uh, who who uh, are way too far on the sort of comm side as opposed to the 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 policy side. Um, you know, famously in the last Congress, right, Madison Cawthorn basically devoted his entire budget to comms. Uh, so so you know, I, I would I, I want there to be some kind of um, uh, some kind of balance there. Um, but I, I do think that the comm side is also uh, quite important. Great. Well, I think with that, we can move on to the phase two of our discussion where I ask you questions I've asked everybody else who's come on the program, if you're ready for phase two. Sure. Uh, first question here is, uh, you know, the fundamental one. What do you think congressional representation should mean? So that's, I mean, that's that's a big question. Um, I think that, um, you know, in any representative body, there's there's uh, there's got to be a mix between um, uh, reflecting your constituents and trying to to sort of guide your constituents. So um, 
you know, I, I, I don't think it just means trying to aggregate um, uh, you know, what your constituents want. I also think it, there's a there's an important opinion formation role, right? Members of Congress have uh, not only access to uh, information that, that most ordinary citizens don't have access to, but they also have the ability to devote more of their time to thinking and learning about matters of public concern uh, than uh, people who have other day jobs do, which means uh, that they, that, um, they ought to be sort of thinking in terms of not just what their constituents do want, but perhaps what their constituents ought to want. Um, so I think uh, there's there's a sort of um, equilibrium point somewhere between uh, simply reflecting what your constituents want, but also uh, and also deliberating on the public good and trying to think about what they ought to want and then trying to convince them to want that, right? So it's not just, you know, um, you know I know they want X, but to hell with them, I'm gonna go for Y. It's um, I know they want X. I think Y might be better. Let me go try to explain uh, why that is to them. And what about who they're representing? In that, uh, is it their primary voters? Is it their uh, majority voters? Is it everyone? Is it multi generational? You know, who are these representatives representing in their districts? Right. So, I mean, I would certainly hope that they don't just think it's their primary voters. Um, but obviously, if they're in a safe district, you know, the incentive is to only care about the primary voters, right? Because, um, you know, for a lot of members, you know, their party is going to win the general. And so the only election that matters for them is is, is if they are going to face a primary challenger. I think that's unfortunate. I would like to, to see uh, more competitive districts so that more members really think of themselves as representing the people in their district. Um, and then, yes, I, 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 I think they ought to be thinking at least somewhat multi-generationally, right? You don't you don't want um, uh, a member who thinks that uh, uh, future generations count for nothing, um, and therefore, uh, you know, all we're trying to do is maximize, uh, you know, immediate welfare of the, the present generation. Um, you know, I, I think it, I think reasonable minds can disagree as to what the discount rate should be for for future generations, but um, uh, you know, I, I would hope that members. Um, uh, would think of themselves as engaged as, as sort of one part of a uh, sort of temporally elongated process of self-governance, right? That you can think of yourself as being a tradition that dates back uh, to you know the first Congress uh, starting to meet in 1791, and that hopefully continues uh, well into the future, and that you know you as a member are playing uh, sort of a role in that institution. And I think if you can situate yourself like that. Um, then you understand that, that that this is not just about the present moment, but is actually about something sort of bigger than that. Great. So next question is really about um, Congress allocating its time. How much time should they spend in D.C. versus back in the, back in the district, legislation versus oversight? You know, where do you come down on some, and versus fundraising? Where do you come down on that? I mean, I, I would like them to spend more time in the district than they do. Uh, but, you know, but I, I think it's also important that they spend time uh, in their district. Um, uh, so I, I, I'd like to spend more time in Washington than they do, but I think they should also spend, um, uh, you know, a lot of time in their district. I, I think, you know, there have been a lot of proposals in recent years for sort of how to try to think about that. To my mind, um, I think it would make sense uh, to move away from the four day sort of D.C. legislative work week um, uh where they go back and forth, you know, every weekend. I would rather see, you know, six weeks of of uh, you know six days a week uh, in session, and then six weeks back in the district. Um, I think that would sort of facilitate um, uh, more sustained engagement with the actual Washington side of things. It might actually make the the uh, members sort of interact with one another more often if they were, uh, you know, in town for the weekend uh, when they were in town. Um, so. Even if we're not going to change the total amount of time they spend in D.C. versus back in the district, I think we could reallocate it in ways that might have um, uh, helpful consequences. Um, as far as how much time to spend, they should spend on sort of legislating versus oversight or something like that. I'm not sure that there's really a, a clear dichotomy there, right? Because sometimes oversight is aimed at sort of developing policies that, that will then be encoded in legislation. Um, I will say that I think in recent years, the um, the balance has been tipping a little bit more towards oversight because so much policy development is now concentrated in the leadership, um, right? That, that, that legislation isn't being drafted in committee the way it used to be, that it's being drafted by leadership and then sort of sent to the committee to be reported out to the floor. Um, and so if the committees aren't doing as much work in developing policy that's ultimately going to be encoded in statute, 
um, then, then what are they gonna do with their time? They, they spend more time doing oversight. Um, I would like to see some amount of, of control sort of devolved uh, from leadership back to the committees. You know, I think we see a sort of sine wave across history um, that um, uh, you know the 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 chambers uh, you know power gets more and more concentrated in leadership, and then at some point there's a revolt by backbenchers, um, and power gets dispersed, uh, and then at some point there's a revolt against the dispersion of power, um, and it sort of starts to concentrate more and more in leadership, right? And so um, I, we're at a moment of of high concentration right now. Um, you know, the the sort of apotheosis of that I think is the Gingrich speakership. Um, you know, Pelosi certainly had a tremendous amount of of power concentrated uh, in her office. Um, you know, the recent Republican speakers have maybe had a little bit less in part because they have a more divided uh, conference. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, Boehner and uh, Ryan and, and now McCarthy have all had trouble getting their, their conference to hang together, um, which means there's a little bit more dispersed power, but it still hasn't really been dispersed to the committees. It's been dispersed to the sort of, you know, the Freedom Caucus or the Tea Party Caucus or something like that. Um, so, uh, I, I would like to see a little bit more uh, power sent back to the committees. And I think if that happened, we would then perhaps see members uh, focusing a little bit more on developing legislation than they, than they currently are. All right. So the next question is really about debate, deliberation, or dialogue. Now, how should it occur and how should it be structured in Congress? And you've, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I'd like to hear your thinking through that, that particular question. You know, I, I think most... Um, debate and deliberation in Congress uh, is not actually, uh, it's, it's not realistic to think that it's going to happen on the floor or even necessarily uh, in committee hearings. I think committee hearings, um, you know, there, there are some that are more on the overspeech side of the spectrum. And then there are some, as I said, that are more on the sort of consensus view gathering information side. Um, and those are both, I think, tremendously valuable. Um, but I think in terms of the actual deliberation uh, by members, the actual sort of arguing with one another, I think a lot of that, you know, happens um, uh, in their their caucus meetings. It happens sort of in their offices. It happens in a, you know, maybe mediated way through the media. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I don't think it's a, um, uh, you know, I, I think that that debate, that argumentation is still happening. It's still happening in ways that are accessible to the public, um, uh, either you know because someone you know leaks what was said in the caucus meeting, or because you can sort of see the results of it in terms of how people vote or things like that. So I don't think it's necessarily a problem that it's not happening on the floor; that the floor is basically resolved uh, reserved for uh, sort of set piece speeches to an empty chamber. Um, you know, I know a lot of people think that that's a sort of depressing fact about modern uh, congressional uh, functioning, but I, I. Um, uh, I, I don't think it, it, it signifies a decline in debate or deliberation. I just think it's moved elsewhere. What about if the committees, you know, had closed door meetings and they could have debate and dialogue there? That would presumably strengthen the committee uh, to be in more of a unified position and speak as a single voice, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I'm surprised you don't think of that as a as a potential solution. Well, again, as, as as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't think moving back to presumptively closed hearings is a, is is is, uh, is is plausible um, as a political matter. But um, and I'm also not sure that 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 it would that sort of debate in in a, a closed committee uh, would would sort of lead to uh, more consensus, right? It might just uh, it might just mean that you'd have that dissensus sort of uh, uh, showing itself in the in the in the committee hearing. Um, if it were possible to move back to it, I, I don't necessarily think it would be a bad thing. I'm just not sure that it would really um, necessarily be a good thing either. Great. So my next question is really what fundamental institutional improvements should Congress make within 50 year time frame? Sounds like you have a few of those ideas. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'd go back to the sort of uh, things that I mentioned earlier. I, I want to see Congress really commit to, uh, to, to uh, enhancing its own internal capacity. Um, to 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 sort of building out um, the the institutional structures to um, uh, not only develop uh, information for itself, so not rely heavily on information provided by the executive branch, um, uh, but also then uh, use that information to sort of develop policy proposals, use that information to push back against the executive branch, uh, and and sort of effectively communicate that information to the public. Right. So I think that would be. Um, uh, one thing, and as I said, I think the 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 there seems to be a decent amount of bipartisan uh, consensus behind that. Um, uh, it it was heartening to see how many of the modernization committees, 
proposals uh, have been uh, adopted over the last couple of years. And a lot of what ModCom did was very much in that vein of, of congressional capacity building. Um, so I think, I mean, that, that would be one of my, one of my biggest suggestions. Um, I'd also, you know, I think it's, um, uh, it, it is definitely the case that we have seen more disputes over information between the executive and Congress in the last uh, 20 years than we had seen uh, uh, in long time stretches before that. Um, and so I would like to see Congress think very seriously about how it's going to enforce those demands going forward, because what it's been doing has not worked. It's not worked over a long enough period of time that I think it's safe to say it's not going to work. Um, and so they need to figure out uh, uh, what they're going to do next. All right. Next question is, uh, what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? With respect to congressional reform in particular, that's a really good question. I think, I mean, there's some important, uh, you know, most of my thinking is is sort of, um, is, is his sort of historical institutionalist in, in nature. So I'm interested in sort of how things got to to be the way they are and what sort of the way, you know, how, how they were done differently in the past and what that tells us about sort of what possibilities might be open in the future. And so I'm drawn to sort of accounts of historical um, uh, development um, uh, in Congress. And so, uh, and I th because I think they open up sort of uh, worlds of, of, of reform. Um, uh, so, um, Eric Schickler, uh, who's a, a political scientist at uh, Berkeley, um, uh, his uh, first book, um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the title right now, but um, uh, was tremendously, pluralism. thank you, Disjointed Pluralism. He was on the program. Uh, was tremendously, yeah. got it, uh, was tremendously influential for me, um, uh, even though I blanked on the title for a moment. Um, uh, and I, in, partly, in part because it does that, right? It shows um, uh, uh, sort of how these institutions have uh, operated over the long term, how they've changed over time, um, uh, and and um, I found that tremendously eye opening. Excellent. So, last question is, you know, really about the you know the future direction of your work. What do you have coming, and uh, what can we look forward to? Um, so, actually, I'm I'm just at the very very beginning stages of a of a new book project that um, in some sense builds on some of the earlier themes, but isn't actually um, uh, Congress focused, but is sort of uh, taking a sort of even I think broader. Uh, lens. So um, my my provisional title is existential politics, um, and I'm interested in uh, politics that takes place against the backdrop of a widely shared sense that we're on the brink of constitutional collapse. Um, and my argument is that this is a regularly recurring phenomenon of American political life that um, basically any American who leave, who lives a sort of normal lifespan will have encountered at least one instance, one sort of sustained instance of existential politics in their life. Um, uh, so I'm interested in sort of tracing um, sort of what some of these moments are um, and also trying to think through both why they occur uh, when they do, but also why they occur where they do relative to the rest of the polity. So sometimes the best explanation is uh, a sort of intra-institutional explanation, um, uh, right? So, um, you know, one of the common explanations for uh, why we might be in such a moment right now uh, has to do with high partisan polarization, in particular polarization within our institutions. Right. So one of the explanations you often see is the sort of uh, uh, graph uh, showing that the the two parties are more polarized now than they've in both houses of Congress are more polarized now than they've been at any point since Reconstruction. Um, but then I think about the sort of pre the the instant the, the the clearest instance of it immediately previous to the present moment, which I think of as the sort of long 1960s, um, and that was a moment of incredibly low polarization. In fact, the lowest polarization at any point since uh, since those measurements start. Um, uh, and the explanation there, or the the sort of locus of it there, is much more about sort of protest movements and and things happening sort of out of doors. Um, uh, and so. Um, uh, I'm interested in thinking not only about sort of what these instances are, but but when they happen within institutions, when they happen outside of institutions, when they happen sort of um, uh, near the locus of power, sort of in the national capital and uh, things like that, when they happen on the sort of geographic um, uh, 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 periphery. So I'm interested um, uh, in the early 19th century in the way that the um, that the Plains Indians uh, sort of understood themselves as facing an existential threat from um, uh, from westward expansion. Um, I'm thinking about the the Shawnee rebe uh, rebellion and things like that. Um, so, I, I, so that's that's kind of where it's going. It's a little bit disjointed because, as I said, it's um, at the very very beginning stages of it. Very well, Professor Chavez. Thank you very much for uh, your time and uh, best of luck with the coming projects. Thank you so much. It's great being here. Mm -hmm.